Okay. Uh, well, I want to welcome everybody again to um, our, today's webinar, uh, Making the Most of Your Audubon Forest Bird Habitat Assessment. Uh, my name is Corey Folsom O'Keefe, and I'm the Director of Bird Conservation, and I've been involved in forest bird habitat assessments, I think, since 2014 at this point. So I'm happy to see a lot of familiar names amongst uh, the attendants today. And uh, I do want to just mention that um, today's webinar is actually part of the Lime Forest Block Conservation Project. Uh, the Lime Forest Block uh, is an important bird area that includes the towns of Colchester, East Haddam, Lime, Old Lime, East Lime, and Salem. And this important bird area is particularly important to the wood thrush and the cerulean warbler, as well as a variety of other woodland nesting birds. Via presentations, bird walks, workshops, and demonstrations, uh, the Lime Forest Block Conservation Project has engaged hundreds of people who live within or visit the important bird area about its birds, their habitats, and what they can do to improve habitats for birds in their own backyards and at local nat nature preserves. In the phase of this project, we offered habitat assessments to private land landowners and land trusts within the important bird area. This morning's webinar is the final part of that project uh, but rather than just invite landowners from the Lime Forest Block, we decided to open this up to all of the landowners and land trusts that have ever received our bond forest bird habitat assessments. Um, so we are really excited to have uh, so many different people here today. Uh, Kelly, if you could go on to the next slide. So uh, this morning, we're going to be hearing from uh, Lime Forest Block Assistant Kelly Morgan on forest nesting birds and the habitats that they associate with. And then Eileen Fielding, who's the director of Audubon Sharon, will be talking about plant diversity as it relates to birds. Uh, during Eileen's presentation, we are hoping you'll gain a better understanding of what plants are on your properties already and what you might purchase to further enhance properties, your property for birds. Then next Wednesday, um, if you want to tune in again, we're going to be having forester Eric Hansen uh, joining us, and he will be sharing tips for identifying and managing invasive plant species. Next slide. So I think probably after a year of, of the pandemic, most of us are pretty familiar with Zoom, uh, but just in case you've managed to avoid being on endless Zoom meetings, uh, just a few quick tricks for how to use Zoom. Um, at the top of your screen, you'll see the words view option. Um, and under this, uh, you can hide the video panel. So if you don't wanna see any, any videos, you just wanna see the presentation, you can, you can click hide the video panel. Um, or another thing you can click is side-by-side -side mode. And that will ensure that um, you know, you're seeing the speaker or you're seeing um, the grid view of participants, but it is not blocking the view of the PowerPoint. Uh, also, you can go back and forth between a grid view of participants or just a speaker view. Um, and then you can go back and forth between a, a full screen mode or, or a non full screen mode. Um, and I mentioned very early on when people were just hopping on that, um, you know, if you have, uh, if you have a chance quickly throw your name in the chat. Uh, if you wiggle your mouse at the bottom of the screen, this bar will come up and you can quick chat, click chat and enter your name. Um, also, if you have a question during um, this presentations, uh, you can throw it in there and um, Somebody can, might try to answer it during the presentations. Otherwise, we'll take breaks at the end of each presentation um, to answer those questions. Um, and also during those breaks, if you uh, want to raise your hand, you can click on the reactions button and there's a raise hand button and you can click on that. And then we'll also know that you have a question you want to ask. Um, and uh, I just want to also let people know that we are recording today's presentation, um, you know, and it will be available on our Lime Forest Black Conservation project website uh, after, you know, after today. So um, if anybody wants to go back and watch it again, um, I will send an email out, uh, you know, after the fact with with sort of the link so everybody can go back and sort of watch it again. If, if there's something you really want to like miss, so you don't have to necessarily be like scribbling notes the entire time, you can go back and, and catch those parts of the presentation. Um, uh, next screen. And I do lastly want to just give a shout out to all of our partners that have been involved in the Lime Forest Block Conservation Project. Um, you know, it's been a group effort and uh, we would not be able to sort of do all the work that we've done as part of that project um, without all of our partners and supporters. So um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Kelly Morgan. Thank you, Corey. We're going to talk about the birders dozen in their habitats now and there are 12 species that are fairly common in Connecticut 
and they're representative of Connecticut's priority birds. A forest with suitable habitat for these species likely provides habitat for a wide range of other species. Landowners don't often realize how many birds they have on their property. They see birds at the feeder like the cardinal and black cap chickadee and tufted titmouse, but there's so many other birds that use your forested properties for breeding. A lot of the birds on this list are prevalent in Connecticut and we wanna keep it that way. So we need to work on maintaining forested properties. A couple of the birds on this list have been declining worldwide and the habitats here in the Northeast are their core breeding grounds. So they're very important. Often you'll hear a bird sing long before you see it. So learning some of the birds calls and their songs will help you learn what beautiful birds are using their, your property as nesting grounds. We're gonna take a virtual walk now through the woods. We'll see forested woodlands that can be found all throughout Connecticut. And most likely you'll see pictures that look like your own property. We'll take a look at different types of habitat with varying features and see what particular birds associate with these habitat types. My slides will move. Hmm. There we go. <clears throat> this habitat is deciduous forest with wetlands, a dense understory of thick shrubland or young forest with fields nearby. This is an ideal area for the American woodcock. The dense understory is used for feeding and resting and is surrounded by other stands of thick shrubland or young forests. They prefer patches of five acres or larger so the birds can feed, shifting between different zones of soil moisture. The American woodcock is so beautiful. They probe for earthworms in the soil with their long beak and it's flexible at the tip. So it's perfect for digging down there in the soil and pulling out the worms. Shrub dominated wetlands with open fields nearby is key. If you visit this type of habitat early in the spring, like right now on a really nice warm day, it's still cold at night, but if you get a warm day and you, you visit this area just about dusk, you, you usually will hear their, their nasally Pee, pee is what they sound like when they're in the field. And you might even be lucky enough to see their amazing courtship display. It is so beautiful. Uh, last week, Corey got to see one uh, do their courtship display. So Corey, would you like to describe that? Absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. So um, there's an area near my house that is, you know, exactly the sort of habitat that Kelly was just talking about. There are open areas, there is very wet woodlands, um, you know, so uh, places where a, a American woodcock could really be sort of foraging in the mud for, for earthworms. And uh, I dragged my husband there right at, at sunset. And, uh, but we were well rewarded. There were four or five woodcocks that were consistently displaying. So they would make that peat call and then um, launch themselves into the air, flying all around the, the sky for about like 30 seconds. And then they would sort of fall back down to the ground. Their wings making that sort of twittering noise as they fell back down to the ground and they would go right back to the exact same spot where they originally launched from. So, um, a really cool bird to be able to check out uh, this time of year. Thanks, Corey. You're welcome, Kelly. This habitat is deciduous or mixed woodlands with 50 to 80% canopy cover and a dense shrub understory. And in the picture on the right, you can see mountain laurel in the understory. The black throated blue warbler can be found in this type of habitat, and they have a strong association with mountain laurel. They're sensitive to forest fragmentation and require large continuous tracts of 250 or more acres of forest. The male and female have matching white patches on their wings called handkerchief. 
Only the male is this midnight blue color, while the female color is a dull olive. They pick insects from the underside of leaves in the understory and lower canopy. The males sing to defend their breeding territory and aggressively chase away rival males. They have a buzzy beer, 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 bee song. Yeah, the um the one I remember doing a habitat assessment um, up in Northwest Connecticut, and uh, there was a, a small canopy gap, but with very dense mountain laurel in the understory. And I was with Eric Hansen at the time, and, and I said, Let, "Let's go check out that canopy gap. I've got a good feeling about it." And lo and behold, um, a, a family of black to blue warblers jumped came up out of that that the mountain laurel in that canopy, canopy gap. So their nests are typically pretty low to the ground. Um, you know, but and they'll you'll find them in areas where there's really dense understory. So mountain laurel, striped maple, hobble bush as you go further further north in New England, um, uh, and typically in Connecticut, northwest Connecticut is roughly where you'll find them. Here we've come across the healthy stand of hemlock with a closed canopy and uneven aged woodlands. The black throated green warbler is very likely to be found here, searching for insects at the tops of the canopy. And because they're usually foraging high up in the canopy, they can be really hard to see. They have a very strong association with hemlocks. And if you come across a black throated green warbler on your walk, there's a really good chance that there's a healthy stand of hemlock nearby. They prefer large, continuous tracts of forest of 250 or more acres of closed canopy in softwood or mixed wood forest. They have a, another buzzy z z z z z song. Or strangers in the night. That one's easier to remember. <laughs> strangers in the night. Here's an area of new growth. It's a young deciduous forest with lots of sun and thick shrubby growth. It may re be regenerating after logging, a fire or storm damage. This picture here was taken on one of our assessments here in the Lime Forest block this summer. And uh, the landowner had cleared a huge area of invasives. And this is a few years later, some invasives are grown back, but a lot of other shrubby growth, native growth is also in there. This is another beautiful area. There's not many invasives in there and it certainly looks healthy and um, it may be five years old. The chestnut-sided warbler is a lover of young habitat. They'll move into these areas of new growth just a few years after the disturbance. Young habitat is key. They nest in these young deciduous habitats and thickets and they flit and hop around thin little branches inspecting the undersides of the leaves for insects and they're easily identified by their bright yellow crown, black face markings, and their rich chestnut flanks. This, this is one of the most beautiful birds we have in our forest, I think. They aren't this beautiful bright color in the fall, but they still have their bright yellow crown. Their song is a, please, please, please to meet ya, with a real emphasis on the cha. Please, please, please to meet ya. Yeah, you'll often find them in power line rights of ways, um, field edges, um, or uh, in a clear cut, uh, say two to three years um, following the, the harvest of those trees. Um, and as Kelly, Kelly said, in the fall, they, they look quite a bit different. They are mostly yellow on the top, white below, but they have a very, very distinct white eye ring in the fall. So um, they kind of throw you for a loop because you're like, wait a second, what, what is that? Um, but it is a sort of another version of the chestnut sided warbler. Here's a deciduous forested area with a nearly closed canopy and an open midstory. The closed canopy keeps the sunlight from hitting the forest floor, so not much is going to grow in a midstory. The eastern wood peewee likes an open midstory for nesting. Probably they feel safer from predators reaching their nest, but they're also found in clearings and canopy back gaps. This is where they 
sally out from, for insects from snags, which serve as foraging perches. Canopy gaps have more sunlight, so insects can be found more readily here. The eastern wood peewee is pretty inconspicuous and hard to tell apart from other flycatchers, so recognizing their song is key to identifying them. It's a very distinctive song and easy to learn, and they sing just about all day, so you can get a positive ID pretty easily. They sound like a peewee. Here we've got a couple of beautiful streams running through a forested property. It has a nearly closed canopy and there's a lot of woody debris where birds can find lots of insects. You might find stumps or uprooted roots of a fallen tree. When you come across this type of habitat with these features, take a minute to stop and listen. You'll probably hear the bright chip of the Louisiana water thrush. This warbler nests in cavities under steep stream side banks or in the upturned roots of fallen trees that's near water. When you see them hopping around along rocks and along the edge of the stream, you'll see them constantly bobbing their rear end up and down like they're doing a little dance and getting their forest groove on. This is one of the earliest warblers of our northeastern breeding grounds in the spring and they're also one of the first ones to leave after they raise their clutch. Their song is like a southern bell saying, hey, 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 watch where you're going. With the Louisiana water thrush, the emphasis is sort of on the first few syllables that, hey, 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 and then watch where you're going, versus the northern water thrush, which doesn't typically breed in Connecticut, although it might in the, the northernmost corners. Um, tends to associate with swampier habitats. Um, and for them, the emphasis is on the last part of the, the song. So they are, hey, 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 chitty, chitty, bang, bang. So um, that's how you can kind of tell the two of those apart. Thanks, Corey. You're welcome. Now we're in a really large block size forest with really, really big mature trees. There's a good supply of decaying down wood for foraging for insects and larvae. When we find a tree like this, we can tell for certain what type of bird is using this habitat. The holes are elongated and more rectangular than round. Pileated woodpecker lives in mature deciduous or mixed woodlands, and they need large trees for nesting and roosting cavities. They're about the size of a crow, and they're one of the largest and most striking forest birds we have, with its flaming red crest and bold white stripes down the neck. They're one of the excavation birds that we have. The picture on the right shows the white wing bars, which is what you will see if they're flying through the woods. Oftentimes you'll hear them, you'll hear them pounding on the tree, but you'll actually see them when they're taking off through the woods and the white wing bars really stand out. While you're walking in the woods and you find a big area of wood chips around the base of a tree, you look up and you'll probably see the handiwork of the pileated. Their territorial call to me is pretty obnoxious and it's very loud, kind of like a That was a great impression, Kelly. I'm, I'm <laughs> um, sometimes uh, people see the, you know, the damage that a pileated woodpecker can do to a tree and they ask the question of like, Oh, is, is the tree okay? Will the tree recover from this? Um, and, you know, it, we know the reason the pileated woodpecker tends, to, it will, will sort of choose a tree for, for sort of excavating or, or sort of drilling into is because that tree, for, you know, actually has insects that are living inside of it. So that it is actually going after the ants or the beetles um, that inhabit that tree. Um, so if a pileated is sort of pecking at a tree on your property, uh, it's probably a sign that that tree actually is not in great health in the first place. Um, because it does have some sort of insect ex excavation. Um, and if it's it's not a safety hazard, uh, fine to just leave that tree. It may eventually die. It may, um, you know, become a, a snag that will, you know, provide uh, lots of excavations for woodpeckers, potentially cavities down the line. 
Um, you know, but if it is right near an area where you're frequently sort of walking, um, you know, you may want to think about having that tree taken down just for, for safety's sake. So um, just something to think about, you know, if you see pileated woodpeckers on your property, um, you know, hollowing, you know, kind of pecking away at certain trees. Here we have an uneven age deciduous forest with a mostly closed canopy. On the forest floor, we see lots of oak leaves. We see lots of mature big oaks, and we know that oaks support a huge number and variety of caterpillars and provide high quality food for nesting and fledgling birds. On the right, we see a good dense growth of blueberries in the foreground. While there might not be enough light, sunlight coming through that canopy for berries to grow, uh, birds still use those blueberry bushes, uh, even without the berries, because there's so many insects that associate with the plant. So even if there's not enough sunlight and there's no blueberries on it, they're still finding a good source of food with those berries. This is a great habitat for the scarlet tanager, forages in the leafy upper branches. They associate with openings in the canopy where they can fly out for insects. They have a very strong association with oaks. The scarlet tanagers are also sensitive to uh, forested areas. In a heavily forested landscape, a patch of at least 40 acres is needed for successful breeding. They need even larger patches in less forested landscapes. The scarlet tanager is by far the showiest bird in the eastern forest, but they're also very frustrating because you might hear the chick burr, chick burr, and know that it's right up there somewhere but that bright cherry red blends in really well with the green canopy. They're definitely one of the birds that you spend a lot of time looking for way up in the tops of the trees. And they also have a song that sounds a little bit like a robin with a sore throat. Well, first here's the, the chick burr. Which I, I find, you know that, and you're in the woods, you hear it, you're like, oh, there's a scarlet tanager somewhere around here. Um, but here is the song as well. <clears throat> this is a deciduous and mixed forest with thick understory vegetation. The habitat has canopy gaps and openings that let the sunlight hit the forest floor promoting the growth of that understory. The red-eyed vireo breed in this type of habitat, and they're often found near openings in the interior forest, foraging for insects. Their song sounds like a, here I am, where are you? They are our ventriloquists of the forest. Last, spring I was in the woods and I could hear a red-eyed vireo singing and it was singing incessantly and it was really close by and I could not find him. It sounded like he was over here and he's over there but he, he just stayed in the same place singing and I could not find him and I, I remember finally saying I'm right here where are you and he said here I am where are you and I never did find him but they sure are beautiful. Here we've got a dense, damp, mostly deciduous woodland with swampy areas and maybe a stream. Has a mostly closed canopy with a dense understory. Picture on the right is during winter or very early spring, but you can still visualize what it would look like during leaf on when nesting occurs. There's lots of leaf litter and woody debris with lots of insects. You can almost hear the mosquitoes swarming in these pictures. The viri is a small thrush that breeds in this wetland habitat, often building their nests on the ground in clumps of grass or close to the ground. Beavers help to create great habitat for the viri by flooding the forested area and taking down large trees, which enables a dense understory to grow. One of their calls sounds like their name, veer, veer. Viries are a species that actually nest right on the ground. 
Um, and having uh, leaf litter present is, is important to both the viri um, and the wood thrush um, because they are sort of move foraging underneath the leaf litter looking for, for insects. Mature deciduous or trees on a hillside or slope, a mostly closed canopy and a shrubby understory. If you see these features on a hillside, keep an eye out for the worm eating warbler. They have a strong association with slopes. This bird uses its kind of drab colors as camouflage when it's sitting on a nest and the mother won't move unless she's practically touched. If she's flushed off the nest, to land close by and flap around on the ground like she's dragging a broken wing to divert predators away from the nest. She is a really good mama and their song is a dry insect-like trill. It's a species that, uh, as Kelly said, is definitely really associated with, with slopes. Um, uh, but when you hear it, it's, it's a very insect-like, dry, but somewhat relaxing trill. When I've been walking through the woods and I hear worm eating warbler, I go, oh. So it's a, it's a really nice song to hear. Our last habitat to take a look at is a deciduous or mixed woods with a closed canopy and a moderate understory of shrubs and saplings. A fairly open forest floor with damp soil where birds can feed on leaf litter and vertebrates. The wood thrush hops, hops around through the leaf litter, tossing it around, searching for insects. They'll spend a few seconds flipping through the leaves then bob upright to look around and make sure the coast is clear, then go back to foraging. I find that when they bob their head up and expose that beautiful white breast with dark markings is when they're easiest to spot on the forest floor. Wood thrushes are area sensitive and in heavily forested landscape, a patch of at least 70 acres is needed for successful breeding. Larger patches are needed in less forested landscapes. The wood thrush song is my absolute favorite. I remember when I was a kid, I would hear them early in the morning and late in the evening. And it would, I would think that maybe somebody was playing a flute in the woods because I didn't believe it was possible for a bird to make such a beautiful melodic sound. And it's kind of like a ching, 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 iole. Give it about a month and hopefully we'll, we'll hear some of these guys in our, in our woodlands again. Um, Beautiful. Them is having a little bit of fireworks at the end of their song. Um, these guys, like I said, with viris are, are um, very much associated with leaf litter, um, but they nest uh, in the understory or the midstory. And um, the, both the wood thrush and the, the pileated woodpecker are species that I notice um, uh, they can do okay in neighborhoods that have, uh, you know, lot good, have houses but have large lots. So if you have a house, but then a good amount of woods between that house and the next house, um, you know, wood thrush can actually uh, do okay in that sort of a neighborhood. Um, same thing with pileated woodpecker. They need big trees and they need a lot of woods, but if there's houses sort of interdispersed in it, a few of them, they, they, that species can do okay in that sort of habitat too. Super. Thank you, Corey. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and turn it over to Eileen. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you, Kelly, for your awesome uh, virtual bird walk. Much appreciated. Um, if does anybody have a question um, for Kelly at this time? If you do, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. Um, or you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can, you can ask it. Uh, but if I don't see any questions in the next uh, 15 seconds, I think I will um, turn it over to Eileen. Uh, I see a question from Mike uh, McCracken uh, about what about owls? So we have uh, two owl species that I would say are, are fairly common in, in our woodlands in Connecticut. So that would be the barred owl, uh, which tends to associate with um, forested streams or sort of uh, sort of forested forested swampy areas, uh, and then eastern screech owl, which tends to associate with um, a sort of uh, red maple swamps. 
Um, so if you have either of those habitats on your property, uh, those two owls you might see uh, or come across. And then we do have great horned owls in Connecticut too, but they tend to be more associated with open fields. Um, so not so much the forest, although they, you know, on the edge of the forest is, is, uh, is good habitat for them. Okay, Eileen, uh, take it away. There's one more question, but I'll, I can answer it in the chat. Okay, thank you. A uh, couple of things uh, to start off with. Um, uh, from where I am sitting, the internet is not always 100% reliable. So if at some point I freeze and become inaudible or I drop off entirely, um, Corey is able to reboot my slide program and uh, we can provide it for you from another venue and hopefully I will uh, scramble my way back on and continue narrating. But let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, and just as we were doing with Kelly's presentation, I'm uh, certainly hoping, Corey, that you will chime in with some of your personal experiences with some of these birds as, as I tackle some of the generalities. I'm going to be talking about the relationships uh, between plant species and uh, the diversity of plant species and birds. Um, Kelly just did a wonderful job of relating uh, bird habitat to what the habitat structure is. So whether there's an open forest floor or a densely covered one, whether there's a sparse mid, uh, mid layer or a dense one, whether there's a closed canopy or a canopy with gaps, whether there's leaf litter, whether there's down dead wood, standing dead wood, all those structural things are very important, but also the identity of the species uh, of plants is also a factor in uh, managing a property for, uh, for bird habitat. So that's what the emphasis is going to be uh, in this presentation. And of course, there are hundreds and hundreds of species to cover. So uh, we're not going to cover them individually. I'll, I'll try to cover them in groups. And since a lot of you on this uh, call are uh, people who already have some sort of forest management plan um, or a bird habitat enhancement plan or um, a combination of the two, um, you, may, you might already have some idea of what's on your property. Um, some of the questions we want to tackle right now are, what do I have on my property that's already good habitat for birds in terms of species now, uh, as well as in terms of structure? And um, how do I find out more about what's on my property? And then once I've gotten that far, what can I do to make it even better? So uh, let's jump in and see what we can do here. Uh, mm -mm -mm -mm. So um, I've already touched on this a little bit. If plant diversity is important, uh, do I really have to know all the plants? Well, no, you don't have to be a professional botanist. And that's why we're going to talk a little bit about how when you're on your property, can you spot groups or types of plants and have some idea of, of what their uses by birds might be. And again, I encourage you to look at your own um, uh, bird habitat assessments if you have them, because uh, plant species are probably mentioned. You probably already have a head start on uh, having some of this identified, and you may be able to identify some of these plants yourself. So let's look at some major categories. Um, these are sort of uh, uh, resource types that uh, are important to birds. There are some bird species that need what we call hard mast, which is uh, the nuts and the acorns in the woods. Um, not a lot of the birds, but uh, it is significant for some of them. And then there's soft mast, which is the term that we tend to use for all kinds of fruits and berries. And that of course is a very important resource for birds throughout the, throughout the seasons actually. And then something a little bit uh, less conspicuous, the buds of trees, the pollen of tree flowers and shrub flowers and uh, herbaceous vegetation on the ground, and the nectar that can be obtained uh, from some of these plants. Insects are a big factor. Um, and we are gonna talk about insect diversity. That's an even bigger topic, um, but we'll talk about um, how a diversity of plants leads to an abundance of insects. And then there's nesting material and stru uh, structures for nesting or cover uh, was pretty much what Kelly was covering uh, in talking about forest structure types. So those are some of the kinds of resources. 
Um, here's typical, uh, typical sources of hard mast. Uh, these are sources of acorns. These are typical oaks, you know, the white oak uh, in the upper left with those rounded lobes on the leaves. Um, and the red and black oak types um, on the upper right with the sharp points on the leaves and the chestnut oak uh, with the wavy edges down at the bottom left on its leaves um, and some uh, typical acorns. And um, uh, hold on one second. I'm just making my own slide visible to me here. <laughs> and uh, other sources of hard mast are things like hazelnuts and beech nuts and also hickories and other nut bearing trees. Uh, if you're not familiar with what American hazelnut looks like, um, there it is. It's, it's more of a shrub than a tree on the left. And of course, beech nuts uh, from the American beech on the right. So if we're talking about birds, um, who eats hard mast? Well, um, these are three of the big ones. Um, blue jays are uh, not only consumers of acorns, they're also great dispersers of acorns and turkeys and wood ducks will also make use of a hard mast. Uh, and uh, this is a category I didn't mention earlier, but of course, all these uh, forest plants uh, could be producing dry seeds of one kind or another. There are birds that specialize in extracting seeds from conifers, uh, things like crossbills, um, and then other birds that are not specialized, but are capable of getting those conifer seeds. Um, birds like goldfinches and nuthatches uh, will take advantage of seeds and dried flower heads. Down in the bottom center there, the tiny little birch seeds can be a source uh, throughout the winter. These seeds are sitting on snow. And of course, the maples, um, all the various kinds with uh, their seeds called samaras, uh, are also a significant source of seeds. And these are just a few examples. And then the flowers and the buds and the pollen and the nectar this is available, uh, starting to be available right now. Uh, we might not be noticing it so much, uh, but the birds are. Uh, the red maples are starting to flower already. Uh, the willows are starting to uh, come out of their catkins. And uh, the pollen and the nectar from these, uh, these plants is a source of protein, it's a source of sugars, and it's also a source of insects. So uh, walking your woods right now, keep an eye out on those spring cat catkins, um, the willow, the birch, the maple, the alder, and um, see who's hovering around them and uh, getting the benefit of the pollen uh, and later on the nectar. And it's not just in the spring, um, buds are a very significant winter food for some birds as well as illustrated by these grouse down in the corner. Tree sap is uh, another resource and we associate tree sap, not only with maple syrup and sugaring, but with the yellow-bellied sapsucker that we see over on the right, uh, one of our woodpecker species. Um, as the name suggests, they do uh, subsist a lot on sap. They're uh, specialized for drilling those rows of holes in tree trunks, which then well up with sap, uh, which can then drip down the trunk and be a food resource for other birds as well. And it also attracts insects which again are uh, a food source for the sapsucker, for the other woodpeckers, and for other birds um, like um, uh, other woodpeckers, cedar waxwings, titmice, chickadees, and even believe it or not, uh, early arriving hummingbirds who don't have access to flower nectar yet will be taking advantage of these uh, sapsucker um, uh, sap sources. That's hard to say. Um, soft mast is a great big category. Um, and uh, I won't go through all of them, but here are three examples here. Um, some of them are tree species like the black cherry uh, and the other cherries. Some of them are, um, well, red cedars can be both uh, shrubs or, or grow up into trees. Um, same thing with American holly. And you'll notice with these um, going from the black cherry, which is available uh, in the summertime and the holly that's available in the wintertime, Soft mast can be available uh, year round. Um, and the red cedar is another example of that. So if you want a good food source for birds, it's good to have a variety of types of soft mast so that those birds that are, are eating fruits have, uh, have fruit year round. Um, it's not all trees and shrubs. Of course, some of the um, smaller vegetation that grows up in sunny clearings can be very important 
like uh, the rubus species, the blackberries and the raspberries, another reason to uh, have sunny gaps somewhere in your woods. And uh, that will also be a great place to find blueberries, high bush and low bush and huckleberries. And as Kelly mentioned, um, these are native plants, so they support insects. So if your uh, blueberries and huckleberries are in strong sunlight a lot of the day, you may get a good berry crop off of them. Uh, and even if you don't, uh, they're sources of nectar um, and they're also sources of insects. Um, and then the elderberries, uh, you might find these in sunny spots near wetter areas in the woods. Uh, they might not be that easy to, uh, to spot. Uh, my experience is that birds eat these so quickly as soon as they're available that you might even never, you might never even notice uh, that uh, you have elderberries because you don't see the elderberries, uh, but they are out there and they're another uh, important soft mast source. Uh, and then there's a, a group of species, the viburnums, um, that go by various, uh, various names. For instance, nano, nanny berry or arrowwood. Uh, they grow in different kinds of habitats. Um, and once again, they're part of the, uh, the year round supply for birds. Uh, some of these birds are very important for uh, sustaining migrants that are coming through and need to drop down for a day and feed and fatten up uh, before they resume their travels, as well as being good uh, food sources for the birds uh, that are resident here or that are breeding here uh, in the summer. Um, spice bush over on the right uh, is uh, an interesting example. Um, it's one of the one of the scratch and sniff uh, sort of identifications. If you don't see these bright red berries, but you think you might be looking at a spice bush, um, it, it when bruised, it has kind of a lemony scent, um, and that might help you to identify it. And um, very aromatic plants like this are sometimes not very appetizing to deer. So if you're uh, uh, up against a lot of deer browse on your property, but you do want to enhance bird habitat, uh, you might want to look at some of the uh, more aromatic and some of the, the better defended plants. Uh, and then there are the dogwoods. Again, there are several species and uh, they have certain characteristics in common that can help you spot a dogwood, uh, the pattern of veins on the leaf, uh, the, um, uh, the basic shape and pattern of the flowers. Uh, there's flowering dogwood, red osier dogwood, gray, gray dogwood, alternate leaved, uh, and even the little um, forest floor, uh, tiny member of the dogwood family named uh, bunchberry. They're all good sources of soft mast. Um, a little uh, trick you can do for identifying a dogwood that makes you look really cool amongst like five to 10 year olds is you can kind of break the leaf and there's like sort of strands like veins that will, will kind of hold the leaf together even though you've sort of broken it in half and it looks like it's like hanging there in midair like magically. Um, it's a way to identify a dogwood but five-year-olds find it fascinating. <laughs> yeah, impress your children and grandchildren while you're walking the woods. Um, here are some uh, uh, winter sources of soft mast. Um, winterberry holly, uh, a type of holly. Um, high bush cranberry, which is actually, uh-oh, uh, needed to check my homework. Uh, Corey, this is actually one of the viburnums, isn't it? Or is it? Quiz question. It looks like it, the leaves look like maple leaf viburnum, but the, I'm not 100%, the flowers, I don't, the, the berries, yeah. I don't look like my maple leaf by Burnham so yeah yeah ignore what I just said I'm, I'm just having a brain glitch here as to uh, what is relate it's related to but it is a good source of winter mast as is uh, staghorn sumac uh, and uh, smooth sumac our, our sumac species don't look terribly appetizing to us who'd want to eat a fuzzy uh, uh, fuzzy berry but they are an important winter food source and our uh, overwintering bluebirds and uh, some of our other overwintering birds like robins will, uh, will rely on these. And then there are the vines and creepers. So you might recognize these on your property. Um, Virginia creeper, poison ivy, uh, climbing up the trees. They're, they're both actually good sources of soft mast. You don't usually think about uh, eating poison ivy berries, but a number of birds will do that, and it can be an important fall and winter food source for them. 
as is uh, Virginia creeper. Uh, grape is not popular uh, always when you're uh, managing your own forested land. And some of these other vines sometimes aren't either because they can tend to creep up into the canopy uh, of, a, of a tree that uh, they're growing on and shade out the canopy of the tree and sometimes even kill the tree. So um, you might want to use your own judgment about uh, where you allow the vines and creepers and where you don't, but they are beneficial to the birds. So if you have one that's on a tree that's already dead, or maybe it's going up a red maple in the middle of a big red maple swamp or something like that, where uh, the loss of one or two of those trees is not gonna be important, this is an, uh, a good source of soft mass. And uh, that grape vine over on the right uh, with that very shredded looking bark is actually another kind of resource for birds. Uh, that's a good source of nesting material. Some birds incorporate quite a bit of grapevine into their nest, um, like this catbird nest over on the left. Uh, it's one way you can identify their nests. They, they preferentially use grapevine as do some other birds. And that gets us into uh, having a diversity of plants so that birds do have nesting materials um, one example uh, here is hummingbirds taking fluff off of cattails. If you have cattails in your wetland, uh, or they will take the fluff off the bases of uh, some fern species, and they will use that to make those, those wonderful soft little nests that are uh, camouflaged with, uh, with lichens and held together with spider webs and just seem too magical to be true. <laughs> uh, but I do wanna spend some time on, on one other aspect of native plants that uh, is not true of plants that have been imported as ornamentals from other continents. And that is that native plants have a suite of insects that have managed to adapt to eating them, which is not true of um, introduced landscaping plants. So one of the most important reasons to support native plant diversity is because they provide insects for the birds. And the, the scale of this as a food source uh, is, is really staggering. For one thing, even those birds that eat the seeds and hard mast and soft mast, when it comes to raising their, their young, they're switching over to insects because they need a, a food source that is much higher in protein and fats and other nutrients for raising uh, baby birds very quickly from hatching to fledging. So, most of these birds are feeding insects to their chicks in huge quantities. You may have heard this, uh, uh, this statistic before because uh, it, it makes the rounds a lot. The entomologist Doug Tallamy um, estimated, oh, well, he didn't estimate, he actually recorded uh, the number of caterpillars that are fed to a uh, nest of baby chickadees to bring those uh, chickadees to fledging. Over 9,000 caterpillars in just a period of a couple of weeks until these, uh, these little chickadees are able to fledge. Multiply that by the number of uh, nesting birds that we have in our Northeastern forests, and you realize how extremely important it is for them to have access to a lot of caterpillars and other insect food. And they don't get it unless the native trees and shrubs and herbs are there. So um, getting back to some of the trees that you might have on your property, here are numbers of caterpillar species supported by oak, willow, cherry, birch, crab apple, blueberry, maple, pine, hickory. Um, this is one of the most important things that these, uh, that these trees do for birds. Um, and uh, we will actually, in a, a bird habitat uh, uh, management guide, uh, make mention of this as uh, you know, a reason to leave some of these trees standing even if you're harvesting some of them. Okay, so let's say you get all fired up and you walk out on your property and uh, you think, I think that's a, a dogwood. I think it might be a viburnum. Uh, I guess that might possibly be a spice bush or a hawthorn or whatever, but you need a little help with plant ID. Um, you can always walk the property <laughs> with a botanist or with a forester uh, or one of us, but the other thing you can do is make use of um, very handy online uh, identification guides where you can even photograph what you're seeing in the field with your cell phone, upload it, and then get help with identifying that individual plant that you are seeing and that you photographed. 
Um, so this is a tremendous resource. And so the next question is, all right, I have some idea of what's on my property. How do I make it better? Well, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, you might want to try encouraging what's already there because those are the plants that you, the native plants that are already there, because those are the plants that you know do well uh, in that, on that site. Another thing, of course, is to clear out the invasives. Uh, so I have a nice discouraging pair of photographs here uh, that were actually taken in my yard, I will admit. Um, this is an incredible thicket of multiflora rose, a non-native invasive that has completely uh, overtaken an area and excluded all the other plants. All I had to do was take the multiflora rose out and almost instantly a thicket of dogwood grew up. I didn't plant it. I didn't even know it was there. And within a couple of years, that same area looked like this. Um, and this is a source not only of soft mast and flowers and nesting structure, uh, but also native insects. And the land did that all by itself. Uh, all I did was get the invasives out of there, which is of course a big task, um, but at least you don't have to go back in and plant all the plants. But if you do uh, want to enhance uh, the diversity of species, native species on your property by um, actually introducing, reintroducing or planting uh, uh, native species. I just want to uh, mention a, a resource here and that is Audubon's Plants for Birds website. Uh, if you go to this website, uh, you will have a chance to uh, plug in your zip code and then you can get a full list of everything native <laughs> that grows uh, in that zip code or uh, best results, uh, the things that grow best in that zip code. Um, and you will get uh, a long list um, with descriptions of the plants and uh, uh, what sorts of birds uh, they are good for, what they will support. But you can also um, apply filters uh, right here I've specified, okay, tell me about shrubs and vines that bear fruit and that support thrushes. Give me that list. Um, and it will duly provide that list. And um, you might want to know, uh, you, you know, might get all enthusiastic and say, well, I want to buy one now. Uh, if you click on the buy now, you may have options. Do you want to buy from um, a vendor that is associated with Audubon? That's one option. Uh, it, it's not an option for, for every kind of plant, but it's uh, one possibility that may pop up. Or you may want to click buy local. And up will pop a list of uh, growers that do supply native plants. Now, this is not a complete list, nor does every uh, supplier on this list supply every kind of native plant, but it's a great way to start. And so I just wanted to uh, make people aware of that. And that's all I have. So I will uh, stop now and hopefully we have some time for Q&A. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you, Eileen, nice presentation. Um, yeah, so we are just about at 11 o'clock, um, but I think Kelly and Eileen and myself are willing to, you know, definitely willing to stay on for, for a bit to, to answer any questions that anybody has. Um, you know, we hope that um, you all enjoyed the presentations and are, are feeling excited about identifying, you know, forest nesting birds when they arrive in Connecticut in the next few, in the next month or so. And that uh, when you are out on your property, you know, you may be looking at your, your vegetation and plants and trees with new eyes, suddenly sort of seeing the value um, of those, of those uh, different types of plants for, for wildlife. Also, you know, you're welcome to follow up with emailed 